The Intel Arc A770 is an interesting card because its performance has improved significantly from launch. And along with the fact that this thing keeps coming down in price, it's becoming a better deal by the day. Is it worth grabbing one of these cards to game on in mid-2024, even though it's not really the best in its class? Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something I missed. I can't cover every aspect of the A770 over the course of a single video, but I figured just discussing some updated benchmarks then diving into some general discussions about the card were appropriate for covering the information I wanted to present. Without any further ado, let's dive into the test system and see what we'll be running. To test the A770, let's throw it in my personal system, an i7-14700K based build. With the Z690 Aorus Elite AX DDR4 as the backbone of this computer, we've got decent memory and storage compatibility, along with the latest in terms of PCIe transfer rates. With the Samsung 970 EVO as the boot SSD and a TimeTech 1TB Gen 4 SSD as the game drive, we've got plenty of quick storage to prevent bottlenecking from this particular subsystem. Along with 64GB of 3600MB transfer per second DDR4, we shouldn't run into any bottlenecks on the memory side of things, and should allow us to focus on the performance of the graphics processing circuitry. All the system specs are in the description if you want to replicate the tests we're performing in this video. With the specs out of the way, let's dive into some games, and see how the A770 is holding up now that we're a bit further into 2024. First up on the benchmark suite is Apex Legends, a now 5-year-old first-person battle royale game built on a fork of the OG Source engine. The performance recorded in late June 2024 is still beyond playable at all resolutions, though it may look like things have regressed because we're testing at higher settings. Returning an average and 1% low of 207 and 145 FPS at 1080p, this isn't really something to complain about. And if you want more frames, then you can always go down to competitive settings. 1440p saw performance dip down to 158 FPS on average with a 120 FPS 1% low. That's still very playable, and in all honesty is very competitive despite the high settings. 4K saw performance dropped to 91 FPS on average and a 1% low of 72 FPS, which also remains playable but much less competitive if you're on a high refresh rate monitor. Apex performs well on the A770, and I don't really have anything to say about it other than it looks and performs about like I'd expect it to. Crisis Remastered is another DirectX 11 based title, but this time on the much more demanding Cry engine. Despite the traditional curb stompage that this game usually hands out, the A770 was able to hold its own at all resolutions. 1080p performed the best, with an average and 1% low of 232 and 128 FPS, and jumping to 1440p, the 1% low doesn't change that much, coming in at 122. The average is more impacted by the jump in resolution, coming in at 186, which I mean is still very playable. 4K performs similarly to Apex, coming in with an average and 1% low of 93 and 63 FPS respectively. Crisis is usually a game that's a bit more on the challenging side to run, and that's definitely the case here at 4K, but the A770 is able to eat this game for breakfast at 1080 and 1440p. Cyberpunk 2077 is where the A770 goes for more of a console-esque experience at 4K, but 1080 and 1440p are beyond playable. With an average and 1% low of 96 and 73 FPS at 1080p, things don't look super impressive. But based on my first-hand experience playing this game, it feels significantly smoother at times than on the older drivers. 1440p returned another playable average and 1% low, coming in at 73 and 59 FPS respectively, though ZSS might be worth considering if you want to play at this resolution or above. Even 4K was playable, but it definitely wasn't optimal, with the 39 FPS average and 35 FPS 1% low. Would I play Cyberbug at these settings at 4K? Probably not, but 1440p I honestly wouldn't mind, and you could probably get away with turning on ray tracing with some upscaling and still hit the 60fps mark. Doom Eternal, an id tech engine game written on the Vulkan API, 
was one of the best performing games tested when taking the graphic settings and presentation into consideration. Tested at the Nightmare preset, the A770 crushed this game at all resolutions, with 1080p in particular providing a very smooth and not noticeably inconsistent 145fps average and 93fps 1% low. 1440p was even impressive with the results, returning an average of 121 and a 1% low of 80. 4K achieved an average and 1% low of 71 and 54 though, which is lower than 1440p by quite a decent margin. But keep in mind how many more high quality pixels the GPU needs to render. Considering we're testing at this game's equivalent to high settings, I think the A770 performs very well, whether it has been specifically optimized by Intel or it's just a Vulkan performance trend. But other titles built on this API perform incredibly well on all of the Alchemist cards, but especially the one we've got here. If you're wanting to get into some Doom Eternal, then the A770 would provide you an awesome experience, though you might be able to find something like an RTX 3070 if you're wanting a similar power envelope. The game up next on our list is built on DirectX 12, but still performs pretty well. Fortnite, in this case at the medium settings with ultra textures, performed very competitively at 1080 and 1440p, and remained somewhat so at 4K, achieving an average and 1% low of 155 and 115 FPS respectively at 1080p. The A770 and 14700K combo can push a competitive experience that could get even better by lowering the setting. But with what we're testing at, I think this is ultimately fine and what most users will gravitate towards. 1440p saw the average dip down to 135, and the 1% low coming in at 103 FPS. The performance loss equates to just under 13% on average which is very impressive considering we're rendering almost double the amount of pixels at the higher resolution. Jumping up to 4x 1080p or 4K, and performance remained playable, but probably not competitively viable due to random stutters and frame dips. With the average and 1% low coming in at 76 and 66 FPS respectively, the game plays like a console version, which is to me pretty impressive considering you can buy this card for the price of a console, and it's pushing 4 times the amount of pixels. Helldivers 2 is one of those games that is getting better as time goes on, but it's still definitely a bit rough around the edges on Intel GPUs. We're testing at the medium preset and native resolution here, so things look much better than potato mode, but not enough to justify running like this. Returning an average and 1% low of 90 and 80 FPS at 1080p, the A770 performs smoothly for the most part, but has some hiccups here and there. 1440p saw the overall performance profile drop to 66 and 58 FPS, which remains playable but is kind of on the cusp of what I think feels good. And then 4K comes in and finishes off with a 41 FPS average and 36 FPS 1% low. The FPS can fluctuate kind of wildly at times at this resolution, so if you're wanting to explore the bug infested worlds of Helldivers, then 1080p is probably the way to go. Upscaling could also be useful here, but I ultimately didn't use it because it makes everything look blurry. The next title is based on DirectX 12, Modern Warfare 3, and by extension Warzone 2. Overall, the A770 performs well, but doesn't stand out amongst the crowd of similarly priced GPUs. A 3060 could beat this performance quite soundly, but for what this card offers, I don't think it's a weakness. Returning 117 FPS on average at 1080p, the card is able to push a somewhat locked high refresh rate experience, but the 1% low of 69 kind of sits as a thorn in its side. Even 1440p has a similar spread between the 1% low, average, and maximum, coming in at 89 FPS on average and 58 FPS on the 1% low. 4K was also playable, but it definitely wasn't competitive. If you think lagging and getting clipped at 120 FPS is annoying, try running it just below 60 almost the entire time. It's right on the cusp of being butter smooth, but it doesn't get there in 75% of situations. The average in 1% low came in at 54 and 39 FPS, which some of you out there are going to say is playable, but if you played it for yourself, trust me, it just felt inconsistent. 1440p didn't have any of those issues, so you could probably get away with turning on CSS at 4K to fix the inconsistencies. Overall, I wouldn't buy an A770 just to play COD, but if you are buying one, then you can play it, and sometimes it can play it pretty damn well. 
The next game is another Vulcan based title, and it really lets the hardware stretch its legs. Red Dead Redemption 2, tested at the Xbox One X settings, looked very good and it's incredible that this game originally came out 6 years ago now. Maybe it's the age of the software, but at all resolutions I didn't have any problems with how it felt. And after playing, I was actually kind of surprised where the 4K results came in at. Starting at set resolution, it came in with a 57 FPS average and a 47 FPS 1% low, which is definitely playable. But it felt like it was hitting a 60 Hz refresh rate pretty consistently, with a drop here or there when an explosion is triggered. Lowering the resolution down to 1440p, and the performance jumps up quite significantly, this time achieving an average and 1% low of 103 and 77 FPS respectively. The game felt very smooth to play, and I could imagine this being an awesome experience on a 1440p variable refresh rate monitor. 1080p came in with a 134fps average and a 95fps 1% low, once again remaining very smooth and, for all intents and purposes, completely playable on the A770. Would I buy this card over a similarly priced used Nvidia card? Potentially because it's honestly pretty good performance but also potentially not because it's drawing a decent amount of power. We're talking around 225 watts to render this. Locking the FPS could help mediate the power issue, but out of the box there aren't any issues. A new game to our test suite, I figured I would add it because I've been playing it somewhat casually, and that's X Defiant. This game has both a DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 backend, and for testing purposes we'll be running everything on DirectX 12. At the high preset, the A770 performs pretty well, returning an average and 1% low of 140 and 90 FPS. 1440p came in a bit lower, hanging out around 111 FPS for the average and 74 for the 1% low. It's definitely still playable and competitively viable, but if you want the most frames, 1080 or 1440p with upscaling seems to be where you'd want to be with the Intel cards. 4K remained playable with an average and 1% low of 69 and 55 FPS, so things are certainly nice to play, but I'd probably lower the settings or turn on resolution scaling if I were hell-bent on playing at this resolution. Even with the strong performance on display, I'm cautious to give my opinions on the A770's performance in comparison to similarly priced GPUs, simply because I just haven't tested it in depth on any other card that I own. For all I know, a 4070 could get quadruple the frame rate. Is that likely? No, but I think you get where I'm going with this. If you want to get an A770 for X Defiant, then there are the performance figures. If they look good for what you want to use the card for, then it might be worth at least checking out. Overall, if I had to give thoughts on the A770, it's that I'm glad Intel more or less knows their niche in the market, and they price their hardware accordingly. From a technical perspective, these cards offer significantly more compute throughput than competing cards from NVIDIA with similar data path counts. But when it comes to actually utilizing that hardware in games and software, the card struggles to fully flex its muscles when it needs to do so. Don't get me wrong, the card can definitely weightlift, and I think that Red Dead Redemption 2, Fortnite, and Doom Eternal are great examples of it. But in other games that people are probably more likely to be playing in current year, besides Fortnite, like Helldivers or Warzone or even Cyberpunk, the game just struggles to keep up with the raw FPS numbers put out by similarly specced cards from the red and green teams. Though Intel has obviously taken this into consideration when pricing their cards, because you can find them for a similar price, if not less than that of an RTX 3060 or RX 6600. This is what I mean by Intel knowing their niche. I'm not trying to mean it in a condescending manner, more so that they're aware of the shortcomings of their product and are pricing them accordingly. They know that they can't price this hardware too high or else no one will buy it. And to be honest, why would the average consumer buy it at this point in time, over a competing Nvidia or AMD card for the same money? Sure, the card has all this theoretical power, but the large team, high budget software utilizing it is pretty light on the ground in 2024. This will 100% change with time, but even when it does finally catch up, the NVIDIA implementation for both the ray tracing and Tensor A6 are a generation ahead in terms of the feature set, leaving the ultimate question of why buy this card? When you launch a product and it's the first generation, you're going to have adoption issues as your immediate barrier to success. You don't have an existing software and hardware base from which to draw developers, and the same goes for consumer level software. It's the chicken and egg problem. 
When the cards first launch, the mass market isn't going to adopt it immediately. And even if it does, there's still going to be some lag time between getting the cards in the hands of developers and writing working software. Pricing is high initially because Intel wants to recoup their development costs. But once more software is running on the hardware, then consumers will be more enticed to just consider Intel as an option because it works with their use case. Combine this with a lower price, whether it be because manufacturing prices have been optimized or they just want to move units, and now you have a much more attractive offer for consumers. But launched at closer to $400, or I'd say consistently over the $380 mark, can now be had for consistently under $300, closer to around $290. The A750 can be found for even less, with those cards coming in at under $200 for a new, unopened card here in the US. If you're a GPU programmer and want to get into sickle programming, then this card and also the A750 provide tons of power that you can squeeze computations from if you know how to properly write your GPU code. Instead of this card being a scaled up integrated graphics solution like what we'd see on an i5 or i7 line desktop processor, it's its own fork of the architecture, giving it the ability to optimize for certain workloads. As a result, this high performance graphics architecture draws more power but achieves more performance. This card isn't going to be as efficient as what is shipped with an iGPU on something like an i3-12100, but it's also not a Fermi situation where you can cook eggs on the thing. If we're being honest, the card has the ability to draw up to 300 watts comfortably from the power connectors, and 375 watts if you really want to get technical by including the motherboard power. But during operation, we're looking at around 160 to 200 watts on average during a gaming workload. A good comparison in the power department is actually the RTX 3060 Ti, another area in power where the Intel card behaves very similarly to an older AMD architecture like GCN 4 or 5 is an idle power draw. My 4070, which is a much more powerful card, draws 15 watts when idling. Compare that to the over 30 watts that the A770 idles at. I'm sure this can be fixed in the drivers because AMD resolved this issue as well. It was quite famously on the RX 4 and 580 and then also on the 5700 family of cards if I recall correctly. It doesn't make the card unusable, but it means that you shouldn't cheap out on your power supply and it's putting out more heat. Overall, is the A770 worth checking out or potentially purchasing to power your next gaming PC? Well, probably not a gaming PC. I mean, it would work and could push decent frame rates as we've seen, but these cards seem like they're designed for work, meaning heavy compute workloads like AI or data visualization. For CAD and modeling programs, these cards are unsung heroes for this price point. Get an i5-12400 and an RK750 or A770, and you've got yourself an incredibly powerful workstation for under $700. But for what this channel traditionally focuses on, gaming and consumer 3D workloads, the A770 is alright. I'd definitely recommend at least checking them out online to see if they'd work for your specific needs and workflow. But for the hardcore gaming crowd, it's probably not worth picking up one of these cards, simply because they're just too expensive. Picking up an A750 would give you the majority of the performance and all of the features, all for like a $100 discount. Either way, the A770 is an interesting critter, and I can't wait to keep taking a look at it in the future. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about the A770. Does the card meet your performance expectations or does it lag behind? And would you even consider trying to get your hands on one? That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.